Yeah, folks, just just be wary. You know, it's it's easy to buy into the hype, but this is a very very small business, and it does, by some certain metrics, appear to be cheap. But this could be one of those stocks that is cheap for a reason. I think they have a lot of chops. I feel like they really want to grow the business and they have carved out a really nice niche in this part of the industry. But I can't say that I would add right now. I'm thinking more hold our current position. Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Onto Innovation's recent announcement that they have made regarding some sales of semiconductor manufacturing equipment. We'll also talk about a new company for us, ACM Research. But first, let's talk about some news from Global Foundries. Just today, they announced that they officially are opening the expansion facility in Singapore. This facility broke ground in 2021, but it is finally opening. So Nick, what does this mean for Global Foundries? It, like you said, it's an expansion of existing manufacturing capabilities. This is quite large expansion, pretty ambitious plan that Global Foundries had announced a couple of years ago, uh, around the time of their, their IPO in 2021. Remember back then it was still the chip shortage specifically for PCs, smartphones, and autos still in the pandemic. A lot of manufacturers were shouting about not having enough chips. Global Foundry said, fine, we'll invest $6 billion to expand our manufacturing. And here we are, like you said, two years later. Casey, we talk a lot about this. It takes years to build new fabs, to build new chip fabs. It takes years to outfit and retool existing fabs. And this one's actually a pretty small one, only at $4 billion. It's still a multi-year project and full production actually won't even be reached until 2025, 2026. But at any rate, Global Foundries has brought this new production online just in time for what is now a chip surplus for <laughs> its smartphone market. Remember Global Foundries focuses on mature nodes they service a lot of semiconductor companies in the smartphone business. Uh, their automaker customers are probably pretty happy though, because they're still reporting some shortage of certain components, at least through the end of this year. Good news for global foundries and investors. Remember there are still two other projects that they had announced each worth about a billion in investment, one at their upstate New York facility, and then one in Germany. So in total, 6 billion invested for them to expand their manufacturing base. Nick, even though we've been in a chip downturn, Global Foundries has held up pretty well. Net income is positive, but what is their free cash flow like? Yes, Casey, maybe put up the chart here from our friends over at Main Street Data showing the revenue and net income performance. As you mentioned, both doing pretty well, sales holding up, net income still positive. Free cash flow, though, deeply negative. You see it bouncing off of a bit of a bottom early this year, but still pretty far into the red. This works out to a negative 660 million over the last 12 month period. And this illustrates the fact, Casey, that it is very expensive to build new fabs. Uh, we covered this with the Wolf Speed earnings disaster a few weeks ago, um, but even Global Foundries just outfitting existing facilities and expanding what they can crank out in the way of wafers, still quite expensive. The good news here is, uh, as we talked about in, in certain other videos, from here on, free cash flow will start to converge with net income. Because remember, net income is an accounting metric you make an expense for property or equipment, but you expense it over time when you're reporting gap net income. Basically, this is, this is for like tax reporting purposes. It's one way to think of this. And then free cash flow is an operating metric. At the time the property and equipment is purchased, the cash leaving is reported, right? Uh, operating metric. So as Global Foundries has spent a lot of money on property and equipment, 
in the last couple of years for these fab expansions. Thus, free cash flow has dipped into the red. Net income has stayed positive, though, because those expenses are realized over time on a gap basis. So going forward, you'll start to see a convergence between that net income and free cash flow margin. It's a solid company. Uh, they've done a good job man- managing all the craziness the last few years and remains on our watch list. Speaking of property and equipment, let's move on to Onto Innovation, which is a small cap company that supplies semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Just a couple weeks ago, Onto announced that they had over $100 million in orders for systems supporting advanced packaging for AI. Nick, can you tell us a little bit more about what this is exactly? Yeah, advanced packaging heterogeneous integration or HI, chiplets, 3D architecture, 2.5D architecture, whatever you want to call it. That's, that's what we're talking about here, Casey, right? I think so. You know, it is. This, this is what we're talking about. Actually, Casey, maybe first, before we delve into this finalization of $100 million in new orders, Give us a rundown on Onto Innovation because I know that people like your explanations of these things a bit better than mine. And we have actually covered this company for quite some time. We started writing about it early this year and actually had our, our first video back in March of this year, nibbled on the stock. It's up 45, 50% since then. What is Onto Innovation? Because this is a small business. It's a niche company that not many investors know about. Onto Innovation is a small cap company, but it is number three in the world for equipment for process control. They fall behind KLA and applied materials, but that's it. The company has a lofty goal of $2 billion in revenue in the next three to five years. This goal is significant because they've actually dipped below the 1 billion mark in annual revenue this year. Metrology and process control has been very hot recently, but Onto has really carved out its own niche in the most advanced chips. And if you go back to our video that recorded previously on Onto, we mentioned a couple specific interesting things that the company focuses on. They have this 4DI technology that is metrology and measuring stuff like for car paint or turbine checks. So check that video out. But one thing that they have really focused on is this process control for advanced packaging. Uh, Important point here, folks. So over the last, let's call it decade, two decades, there's been a lot of focus on front end manufacturing. That's the actual manufacturing that goes into the wafer itself, those silicon disks that eventually get chopped up into the chips. Uh, And now a lot of that is Moore's Law. Uh, Casey, I think we're going to do eventually a Throwback Thursday video on our Moore's Law Part 1 and Part 2 videos that were very early on in this channel. But Moore's Law refers to the shrinking down of the transistors in chips, those on-off switches that are the basis of all modern computing. But the size of those transistors is starting to reach their physical limitation as they get to be just atoms large in in dimension. There's only so much more shrinkage that can happen on the transistor per chip. So one area where a lot of chip companies are focusing their attention now to continue to increase performance is that packaging. Again, chiplets, heterogeneous integration, whatever you want to call it. This is where Onto Innovation has been uh, hitting pay dirt the last few years. And I guess maybe this is where we should talk about the new order that they finalized. This equipment that Nick is talking about is called the Dragonfly G3 inspection system. And this system plays a role in advanced packaging for the AI device market. So these are leading edge chips that combine a graphics processor and HBM devices to create these AI GPUs in a single package. Uh, Casey, measuring stuff in in these chips, measuring the dimensions, uh, quality control, making sure the yield in manufacturing these things comes out in such a way that maximizing the profit for customers uh, buying these machines and installing them 
in their fabs. Casey, you mentioned the GPU, and then you mentioned the high bandwidth memory or HBM. Now, as we know, that's NVIDIA basically is who they just called out as the ultimate customer taking the GPU and co-packaging it up with HBM into one single package. But NVIDIA is not the company actually buying the Dragonfly G3 machines and installing them because NVIDIA is fabless. So likely the likely purchasers of, of these Dragonfly G3 machines are Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, TSM, because they handle much of the GPU fabrication for NVIDIA. And then on the HBM side, this is probably SK Hynix or possibly also Samsung. SK Hynix and Samsung, it sounds like, have both been involved with NVIDIA on the memory side of this problem. And there could be others involved here too, because NVIDIA itself said in their last earnings call that they've been working really hard to increase their number of suppliers to meet demand for all of these AI systems. But at the end of the day here, I think it's safe to say NVIDIA is the ultimate customer that's driving the demand for the Dragonfly G3 from onto, and maybe to a lesser extent, AMD with its new MI300 graphics processing units for, for data center AI, pushing their fab suppliers, TSMC, SK Hynix, and possibly Samsung. The financials of this deal Nick, are interesting because 100 million may not seem like a lot of money when it comes to these very large semiconductor manufacturing equipment devices. However, it is a big deal for Onto Innovation. And in an earnings call, management said that the Dragonfly G3 system was expected to be 90 million in sales over the next three quarters. So that was the quarter that concludes at the end of September all the way through March 2024. Now with the finalization of this last order, that purchase amount is now over $100 million, plus the new orders are now extending into the second half of 2024. So we can see that this is a huge boon for Onto Innovation. Yeah, absolutely. Especially like you mentioned before, Casey, the company is suffering a bit this year from the downturn in, in the chip market and the customers trying to conserve cash. So they peaked at 1 billion in sales in 2022 and that figure's headed, headed south in 2023. It's probably gonna be less than $900 million. So these incremental orders they're now picking up for that Dragonfly G3, we're talking about orders here that could equate to uh, upwards of 20% of their total annualized revenue at this point. So management provides this three to five year guidance back in June for 2 billion in sales. That's, that's the top end of their goal. So you and I as investors start looking for proof. How do you get there onto innovation? Here's one way that they're doing it is brand new sales of a, a let's say brand new machine for this new market addressing GPUs, data center, AI. This is really quite a big deal for a small business. At this point, the stock, like I said, it's doubled over the last year, up 45, 50% since we initially nibbled on it in March, uh, but still a small business in the grand scheme of things, especially when you're talking about giant competitors like KLA Core and Applied Materials that do many billions of sales every single quarter. Nick. Onto Innovation has $610 million in cash and short-term investments. It has no debt. And at its investor date, it alluded to the fact that they may be interested in making an acquisition. Do you have any ideas on what type of moves they might make? Yeah, absolutely, Casey. Yeah, that's significant that they have all that cash because it's probably exactly what they're thinking they'll do is use it and possibly the issuance of new stock to make an acquisition. Who might it be? I guess that depends on where management sees value going forward. Now, we already mentioned applied materials and KLA, obviously the big one, it's the specialist, the big giant specialist in metrology and process control. So maybe Onto Innovation tries to just get bigger within this field. There are some smaller competitors that we've covered here. There's Kohu, which we have not covered, uh, not exactly high on our priority list here. 
uh, to cover. There's also Nova and Camtech, both of which I believe are based in Israel that also play in process control and metrology. So maybe Onto would be interested in consolidating the metrology and process control market. I think that's probably the more likely of the two. I think at this point, they're maybe too small to go the route of diversifying into new uh, parts of the semiconductor and, and chip packaging and, and manufacture space. Like applied materials is like the big generalist across multiple types of equipment. So that would be harder to guess, though, if they go that route. But if they're going to just try to consolidate, I think it would be a smaller pick, like one of those one of those three. Let's say Nova, Camtech, or Kohu. Maybe. Perhaps. Okay, so that's the situation. Casey, let's roll reverse here. Onto Innovation is trading for 34, 35 times expected 2023 earnings. Okay. Uh, now this metric assumes that earnings continue to fall on a year over year basis uh, for the rest of 2023 for Q3 and Q4. And it looks like analysts expect things to start heating up again, starting in calendar year, 2024, maybe around Q1, Q2 next year, they return to year over year growth. So let me ask you, Casey, 34 times expected current year earnings. What do you think? Are, are we buying onto innovation? Uh, stock price as of this moment at about 125 bucks a share? This is a tough question for me, Nick, because I really like onto innovation. You know this. I think they have a lot of chops. I feel like they really want to grow the business and they have carved out a really nice niche in this part of the industry. But I can't say that I would add right now. I'm thinking more hold our current position. What do you think? I think that's a safe assessment and I will defer to your assessment on that because I agree. Great business. We already have a position. I think we're in wait and see what happens next mode. Okay, so a follow-up question for you here before we move on to our last company. I feel like maybe I'm price anchoring a bit though. So let me ask you about this. When we bought the stock, it was like low eighties. It's now at 125. What would you tell me if I'm like, I don't want to buy it now because it's expensive because the first time I bought it, it was 80 bucks, let's say, and now it's at 125. I would say that's never a good way to invest. <laughs> Ultimately, if you like the business and you truly believe that it's going to grow, it would be better to just dollar cost average, at least in my mind. 125 may seem expensive right now because we bought in the 80s, but it could be 200 next, at the end of next year. Yeah, so I guess what it comes down to, right, is what do we think the business does in 2024 and maybe through 2025, 2026? And that's our big picture outlook on this semiconductor manufacturing equipment space, we see boom times coming again that maybe peak, uh, hit a cyclical peak in 2025, again, maybe 2026. So I don't know, I guess maybe the question then, Casey, to kind of take the opposite side of the argument here, if that's our outlook, is the stock really too expensive right now? Uh, maybe we need to go out to 2025 and try to estimate what earnings will be at that point in time and base our buy assumption on the stock from that point. Your thoughts? For me, I would say some of that is already baked into the current stock price. As you said, 34, 35 times earnings, future earnings. I would say for me, it's a better dollar cost average at this point. Okay. I wanted to just try to poke some holes in your argument there for a moment, but I guess maybe at the end of the day here, at least as far as we go, stay tuned for more details. We're not buying the stock at this point, but it's a business that we think you should definitely be aware of and keep on your radar, keep on your watch list, whatever it is you call it, folks, whatever you have out there that you use to keep track of stocks onto innovation is one of those semiconductor stocks you should probably be watching. 
Now for ACM Research. This company is interesting, Nick, because it has one of the highest growth rates expected over the next three to five years. You told me that it's a, at a 30% CAGR over the next three to five years. So what does ACM Research do? So I think we're talking about it because we get asked questions about it fairly frequently. It gets requested fairly often. I'll cover ACM Research, please. And it probably all has to do with the, that fact you just rattled off, Casey, 30% or more, depending on who you ask, expected CAGR, compound annual rate, revenue growth rate over the next three to five years. Let's just maybe acknowledge that. This is this is a weird business because it's based in California. It's based in Silicon Valley. It's based in Fremont, right? We know where Fremont is. Yeah, that's where one of the Tesla factories is, where the headquarters used to be. Right. Used to be. So it's a Silicon Valley company. However, it's not really a Silicon Valley business. Its actual main base of operations is in China. And the vast majority of its sales, almost all of its sales, I should say, up until just recently here in recent quarters, is China. Not Taiwan, not Hong Kong, but actually in China. So this is an odd business that I think has some unique risks investors should be aware of uh, before they pile into it because they think, wow, 30% plus CAGR over the next three to five years, I want in on that. ACM Research made $389 million for the full year revenue for 2022. That's up 49% from the previous year, 2021, and they expect at the midpoint, full year revenue for 2023 is 550 million. What exactly is this company make, Nick? Yeah, for what should be a slower semi-cap business that sells big, giant, expensive pieces of machinery, this is a fast-growing enterprise all of a sudden. And the key is in that geography, Casey. It's selling equipment specifically equipment used in, let's not say advanced manufacturing nodes, but what used to be advanced manufacturing nodes about five to 10 years ago to chip fabs in China. Now they have a slide presentation here that shows their top customers. And I think for many investors, some of these are going to jump off the page as China's premier state-backed, state-funded semiconductor manufacturers. So SMIC, Semiconductor Manufacturing International, we just talked about them fairly extensively uh, late last week. The, the other one that you see here, uh, the gray and purplish logo, that's Yangtze Memory, which maybe that is recognizable because they're at the heart of the legal spat Micron is having in China. Uh, also some South Korean customers as well, SK Hynix. Now, as for what the company does specifically, the type of equipment they have historically made all their money on is wafer processing. Okay. This sounds like really silly, not all that important equipment. To put it simply, what this type of equipment does is it cleans the surface of the wafer between steps involved in the manufacturing process. But this is actually a pretty critical step because especially during certain processes, let's say uh, during the lithography step, let's call it deep ultraviolet lithography since this equipment is going to China and they're using DUV machines from like ASML to try to craft those seven nanometer and smaller chips. Uh, when you're talking about features that small, it becomes very, very fragile. And so you can't just like jet wash the thing after the lithography step and remove the material that's not needed or during the etching step, or maybe you have those through silicon vias in, in a, a 3D stack, a memory chip stack. How do you get material out of these features that are just a couple, a few nanometers in dimension? If you just simply pressure wash the thing or take some caustic material to it to try to strip off that material, that little microscopic city that you've crafted on the top of the wafer, like suddenly your washing process becomes like Godzilla, a microscopic city, and you've just flattened all of the work that you've done in processing that 
that wafer and manufacturing that wafer. So this processing equipment is very critical. Uh, more recently, they've gotten in, into electroplating. So laying down copper or gold connects on, on the chip or like filling those through silicon vias with copper and then polishing it after the fact. So a little bit of packaging going on here as well. Interesting business and most of the sales up to this point have been going to China. And as China tries to ramp up its domestic semiconductor manufacturing industry, it looks like ACM Research is a top beneficiary of this move. Who are the competitors for ACM Research? Ooh, okay. So this is where things get really interesting, Casey. And then I'm going to ask your thoughts on this. The way for processing... Um, and the different work involved in those steps, uh, Tokyo Electron, which I, th- I think we've we've covered at least in passing a number of times. They're one of the Fab Five: ASML, Applied Materials, LAM Research, Tokyo Electron, and KLA Core. The big five companies that control the majority of the semiconductor manufacturing space. So Tokyo Electron is one player uh, that does a lot with this wafer processing, and then LAM Research which does a really great job with the, the electroplating part of the market. Applied materials is, I think, a ubiquitous competitor with everybody in the semi-cap space. But some other smaller players, but I would say the two primary ones that make things interesting are LAM Research and Tokyo Electron. Here's what we do know about ACM Research. And they've been testing and shipping equipment to a... U.S. chip manufacturer in Oregon. Who's that? Uh, That would be Intel, right? But this this is where I find things interesting. Does this make ACM research uninvestable, knowing that there's this geopolitical intrigue? Yeah, that's definitely an interesting situation, Nick. Intel is technically purchasing from a U.S.-based business headquartered in Fremont, California. Said the risk is that the U.S. government says, wait a second, you may be headquartered in Fremont, California, but actually you're sending the majority of your equipment to China, which the U.S. government has put in sanctions in place to prevent the acceleration of China's progress in AI and semiconductor manufacturing. So this is not to express any political viewpoint one way or the other here, but it does seem like it does pose a risk for investors knowing that is a possibility, especially with the latest news. Yeah, I was also thinking as well, Casey, that most of the sales are still headed for China, but a big area of growth just in the last couple of quarters is tied to that customer in the U.S., So ACM starting to diversify its revenue base outside of China. And it looks like Intel in the U.S. is one of those. And then they have also cited a European customer that has begun testing equipment and may start accepting orders by the end of this year. We don't know who that is yet, but uh, my guess is maybe it's like an Infineon that's testing out uh, some of this wafer processing and possibly other, some of the advanced packaging products as well. So at this point, just so everybody understands what's going on here, in Q2 2023, ACM Research did $145 million in sales. Only $9.8 million of that was outside of China. So 7% basically revenue outside of China. We're talking about just a few machines to Intel, maybe a machine or two to uh, someone in Europe. Maybe it's Infineon, uh, maybe it's Global Foundry and, and that fab we talked about, they're expanding in Germany. We don't know, but if the company wants to diversify outside of China, I wonder if there's also risk that regulators might say, hey, we're doling out taxpayer money here to help expand semiconductor manufacturing in our home base. We want preference to be given to companies that provide equipment and from within the same territory. Uh, That's another risk I was just also thinking about as well. I think you probably hit the first one, though, that the risk of further sanctions and ACM Research's technical home base was the, the primary risk here. Let's talk about the financials a little bit. 
so stock is around 1850 a share trailing 12 month price to earnings around 18 net income positive free cash flow negative a lot of investors are looking at this stock and thinking this is pretty reasonably priced or even cheap so what is the valuation for this company so a little chart here from our ticker terminal illustrating the, the positive net income negative free cash flow this is exactly the same situation as we talked about with global foundries remember gap net income is an accounting profit metric you've made an expense in the past the cash has been spent but you realize that expense over time so that's how acm research is still reporting positive net income they've spent a lot of money on property and equipment ramping up their headquarters and different sales offices uh, outside of China, uh, ramping up their manufacturing capabilities, buying parts to build machines. Uh, but a lot of that property and equipment gets expensed over time. So that's the difference. Positive net income because of the accounting profit, but negative free cash flow, deeply negative free cash flow, I think is very much so worth pointing out here uh, because of all those expenses. Again, like every other company that's rapidly scaling uh, or spending a lot of money on a new project, those two metrics will converge over time. But investors that are looking at this thinking, wow, 30% plus Kager, only 18 times trailing 12 month PE ratio, not so fast. Uh, there's a lot of geopolitical risk with the stock and on a free cash flow basis, the company is not profitable and it's not likely to turn profitable very quickly, uh, given the amount of expansion that they're going after. Okay. Knowing that Casey, what do you think about this stock? I think we should buy some. No, I think in all seriousness, there's a lot of risks with this company that we've talked about, uh, probably more that we don't even know about at this point, but it could be part of our, our basket of stocks that we take a very small nibble into. I think the upside, the reward could outpace the risk, but it's definitely not something I'd put my whole portfolio in. What do you think? Definitely agree. I think your take is five out of five stars. Yeah, folks, just, just be wary. You know, it's, it's easy to buy into the hype, but this is a very, very small business and it does by some certain metrics appear to be cheap but this could be one of those stocks that is cheap for a reason the, the geopolitical risk is something i would like to be able to put aside right now my hope is that everybody learns how to get along and come to some amicable agreements uh, with each other and you know, the semiconductor industry kind of gets out of this funk where everyone's worried about domiciling more of the market uh, within their borders, but that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So I think that is a very key risk and a reason why the stock appears to be cheap by certain metrics, because if, if this was a company that was more diversified across the whole semiconductor supply chain, the whole global semiconductor supply chain, I think some of that risk discount on that 18 times PE would kind of go away a bit. Because there are other companies in this market, like air test systems, for example, that trade for ludicrously high valuations solely because of the fact that, you know, they have less concentration in China. At any rate, I think your taste is solid, Casey. This is a small cap stock, and that's our take on small cap stocks. You need to buy a basket of them. They need to be very small positions, and you need to assume that most of them are not going to make you any money. We'll keep an eye on it, see how it goes, and we'll let everybody know if we decide to put our toes in the water. We have just under four months to reach our goal of 10,000 subscribers. So if you appreciate the channel, subscribe and share with your fellow investors. We'd love to have them in the community. Yes, and Casey, I'd also like to mention we are hitting our one year anniversary of the Chipstock Investor YouTube channel this week, actually. So. A lot of viewers have been asking us uh, about various projects, you know, expanding our coverage, easier access to what our portfolio looks like, so on and so forth. We are working on something, and I think we'll be ready to announce that really soon. We hope everyone finds it 
useful. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, take care, everyone. See you later at Chipstock Investor.